September 15th through October 15th is Hispanic Heritage Month, which recognizes the influence and the contributions that Hispanic Americans have had on the United States. You can visit the library Schoology course to see more information about this and see what library materials we have. And this week's book bite goes along with that theme. Um, we are going to read the first chapter from the Storm Runner series by J.C. Cervantes. And this book is kind of similar to the Percy Jackson series and um, the Heroes of Olympus series, which are based on Greek and Roman myths. Uh, and this series is based on Maya mythology. So you have a really feisty hero, um, you have some tricky gods, you have some giants, uh, and just a really good fantasy adventure story. It all started when mom screamed. I thought she'd seen a scorpion, but when I got to the kitchen, she was waving a letter over her head and dancing in circles barefoot. After a year of being homeschooled, I was going to get to go to school again. Did you catch that word? Get. As in, someone was allowing me to learn. Stupid. Who put adults in charge anyway? But here's the thing. I didn't want to go to some stuffy private school called Holy Ghost, where nuns gave me the evil eye. And I, for sure, didn't want the Holy Ghost shuttle to come all the way out to no man's land to pick me up. Mine was the last stop. And that meant the van would probably be full when it arrived. And full meant at least a dozen eyes staring at me. I smiled at mom because she looked happy. She took care of sick people in their homes all day, and she also let her brother Hondo live with us. He spent most of his time watching wrestling matches on TV and eating bags of flaming hot Cheetos, so she didn't wear a smile too often. But I didn't know where to start. You said I could be homeschooled. For a year, she said, still beaming. That was the agreement, remember? A single year. Pretty sure that wasn't the agreement, but once something was in mom's head, it was super glued there. Arguing was useless. Plus, I wanted her to be happy, really, really happy. So I nodded hard and fast because the harder I nodded, the more excited I'd look. I even threw in another smile. When? It was September and that meant I'd already missed a month of classes. You start tomorrow. Crap. How about I start in January? Yeah, you could say I was super optimistic. Mom shook her head. This is an incredible opportunity, Zane. Doesn't private school cost a lot? They give you a scholarship. Look, she flashed the letter as proof. Oh. Mom folded the letter neatly. You've been on the waiting list since... She didn't finish her sentence, but she didn't need to. Since referred to the day this jerk, a jerk whose face was seared into my brain had mopped the floor with me at my old school, and I'd sworn I'd never set foot in any place of learning again. What about Mrs. Cab, I asked. She needs my help. How am I going to pay for Rosie's food if I don't work? My neighbor, Mrs. Cab, her real last name was Caballero, but I couldn't pronounce it as a little kid, and the nickname stuck. She was blind and needed an assistant to help her do stuff around the house. Also, she worked as a phone psychic, and I answered the calls before she came on the line. It made her seem more legit. She paid me pretty good, enough to feed my dog Rosie. Rosie was a boxmation, half boxer, half Dalmatian, and ate like an elephant. You can work in the afternoons. Mom took my hand in hers. I hated when she did that during our arguments. Zane, honey, please, things will be mayhor this time. You're 13 now. You need friends. You can't live out here alone with these. Out here was a narrow, dusty road in the New Mexico desert. Other than my two neighbors, there were tumbleweeds, rattlesnakes, coyotes, roadrunners, a dried-up riverbed, and even a dead volcano. But more on that later. Most people are surprised when they found out New Mexico has so many volcanoes. Of course, mine was no ordinary act of nature, right, gods? With these what, I asked, even though I knew she w what she was thinking. Misfits. So what that Mrs. Cab was a little different? And who cared that my other neighbor, Mr. Ortiz, grew weird varieties of chili peppers in his greenhouse? Didn't mean they were misfits. I'm just saying that you need to be with kids your age. But I don't like kids my age, I told her. And I'll learn more without teachers. She couldn't argue with that. I taught myself all sorts of things, like the generals of the Civil War, 
the number of blood vessels in the human body, and the names of stars and planets. That was the best thing about not going to school. I was the boss. Mom ruffled my dark hair and sighed. You're a genius, yes, but I don't like you hanging out with only a bunch of old people. Two isn't a bunch. I guess I'd sort of been hoping Mom would forget our deal. Or maybe Holy Ghost, who named that school anyway, would disappear off the face of the earth in a freak cataclysmic accident. Mom, I got real serious and made her look me in the eye. No one wants to be friends with a freak. I tapped my cane on the ground twice. One of my legs was shorter than the other, which meant I walked with a dumb limp. It earned me all sorts of nicknames from the other kids. Sir Limpsalot, McGimster, Zane the Cane, and my all-time favorite, Uno, for the one good leg. You are not a freak, Zane. And, oh boy, her eyes got all watery like they were going to drown in her sadness. Okay, I'll go, I said because I'd rather face a hundred hateful eyes than two crying ones. She straightened, wiped her tears away with the back of her hand, and said, your uniform is pressed and waiting on your bed. Oh, and I have a present for you. Notice how she dropped the bad news with something good? She should have run for mayor. There was no point in my griping about the uniform, even though the tie would probably give my neck a rash. Instead, I decided to focus on the word present, and I held my breath hoping it wasn't a rosary or something. Mom went to a cabinet and pulled out a skinny umbrella-sized box with a silver ribbon tied around it. What is it? Just open it. Her hands twitched with excitement. I ripped open the box to get to the present that we didn't have money for. Inside was a wad of brown paper and under that a shiny black wooden cane. It had a brass tip shaped like a dragon's head. This is... I blinked and searched for the right word. Do you like it? Her smile could have lit up the whole world. I turned the cane in my hands, testing its weight, and decided it looked like something a warrior would carry, which made it the coolest gift in the universe. I bet it cost a lot. Mom shook her head. It was given to me. Mr. Chang died last week, remember? Mr. Chang was a rich rich client who lived in a grande house in town and sent Mom home with a few with chow mein every Tuesday. He was also a customer of Miss Cab's. She was the one who'd gotten mom the job to take care of him until he died. I hated to think of mom hanging out with dying people, but as she always said, we had to eat. I'd tried eating less, but that was getting harder and harder the older I got. I'd already reached a whopping five foot nine. That made me the tallest in my family. I ran my hands over the brass dragon head with the flames flying out of its mouth. He collected all sorts of things, Mom continued, and his daughter said I should have this. She knew you. She stopped herself. She said the dragon symbolizes protection. So Mom thought I needed protection? That made me feel pretty miserable. But I knew she meant well. I rested my weight against it. It felt perfect, like it was made for me. I was excited to cruise around with this much with this much cooler cane instead of my dumb plain brown one that screamed, I'm a freak. Thanks, Mom. I really like it. I thought it would be going back. To, I thought it would make going back to school easier. Mom said, "Right, easier. Nothing, not even this warrior dragon cane, was going to make me being the new kid any easier." It was a low point, and I didn't think it. I didn't think things could get any worse. But boy, was I wrong. That night, as I lay in bed, I thought about the next day. My stomach was all twisted in knots, and I wished I could turn into a primordial ooze and seep into the ground. Rosie knew something was up because she let out little groans and nuzzled her head against my hand, soft-like. I petted the white patch between her eyes in small circles. I know, girl, I whispered, but Mom looks so happy. I wondered what my dad would say about the whole thing. Not that I'd ever know. I'd never even met the guy. He and mom hadn't gotten married and he'd bounced before I was born. She'd only told me three things about him. He was superbly handsome, her words, not mine. He was from Mexico's Yucatan region. She'd spent time there before I was born and said the sea is like glass. And the third thing, she loved him to pieces. Whatever. It was all quiet except for the crickets and my guts turning. I clicked on the lamp and sat up. 
On my nightstand was the Maya mythology book Mom had given me for my eighth birthday. It was part of a five-volume set about Mexico, but this book was the coolest. I figured it was her way of showing me, showing me my dad's culture without having to talk about him. The book had a tattered green cover with big gold letters in it, The Myths and Magic of Maya. It was filled with color illustrations and stories about the adventures of different gods, kings, and heroes. The gods sounded awesome, but authors lie all the time. I opened the book. On the end papers was an illustration of a Maya death mask made of crumbling jade with squinted lidless eyes and square stone teeth like tiny gravestones. I swear the face was smiling at me. What are you looking at? I huffed, slamming the book closed. I tossed off the covers, got up, and peered out the window. It was all shadows and silence. There was only one good thing about living on the mesa. It was a hundred yards from a dead volcano, a.k.a. the beast. Having my own volcano was about the most interesting thing in my short life. Up until that point, that is. I'd even found a secret entrance into it last month. Rosie and I were hiking down from the top, and about halfway down, I heard a strangled gasp. Naturally, I went to investigate, half expecting to find a hurt animal. But when I parted the scraggly creosote branches, I discovered something else, an opening just big enough to crawl through. It led to a whole labyrinth of caves, and for half a second, I thought about calling National Geographic or something. But then I decided I would rather have a private place for Rosie and me than be on the cover of some dumb magazine. Rosie leaped off the bed when she saw me slip on my sneakers. Come on, girl, let's get out of here. I went outside with my new warrior cane and I limped past Nana's grave. She died when I was two, so I didn't remember her. I crossed the big stretch of desert, zigzagging between Creosote, Ocotillo, and Yucca. The moon looked like a huge fisheye. Maybe I could just pretend to go to school, I said to Rosie, as we got closer to the beast. A black cone rising a couple hundred yards out of the sand to meet the sky. Rosie stopped, sniffed the air. Her ears pricked. Okay, fine. Bad idea. You have a better one? With a whimper, Rosie inched back. You smell something, I said, hoping it wasn't a rattlesnake. I hated snakes. When I didn't hear the familiar rattling, I relaxed. You're not afraid of another jackrabbit, are you? Rosie yelped at me. You were afraid. Don't try to deny it. She took off toward the volcano. Hey, I called, trying to keep up. Wait for me. I would found Rosie wandering the desert four years ago. At the time, I figured someone had dumped her there. She was all skin and bones and she acted skittish at first, like someone had abused her. When I begged mom to let me keep her, she said she couldn't afford to, so I promised to earn money for dog food. Rosie was cinnamon brown like most boxers, but she had black spots all over her, including on her floppy ears, which is why I was sure she had Dalmatian in her too. She only had three legs, so she got me, and I got her. When we got to the base of my volcano, I stopped abruptly. There in the moonlit sand was a series of paw prints, massive with long claws. I stepped into one of the impressions and my size 12 foot took up only a third of the space. The paw was definitely too big to belong to a coyote. I thought maybe they were bear tracks, except bears don't cruise the desert. I kneeled to investigate. Even without the moonlight, I would have been able to see the huge prints because I had perfect eyesight in the dark. Mom called it a sacred ancestral blessing. Whatever. I called it another freak of nature thing. It looked big enough to belong to a dinosaur, Rosie. I sniffed one, she sniffed one, then another, and whimpered. I followed the trail, but it ended suddenly, like whatever creature the prince belonged to had simply vanished. Shivers crept up my spine. Rosie whimpered again, looking up at me with her soft brown eyes as if to say, let's get out of here. Okay, okay, I said, just as eager as she was to get to the top of the volcano. We climbed the switchback trail past my secret cave, which I'd camouflaged with a net of creosote and mesquite branches towards the ridge. When we got to the top, I took in the jaw-dropping view. To the east was a glittering night sky rolling over the desert, and to the west was a lush valley dividing the city and the flat mesa. And beyond that, a looming mountain range with jagged peaks that stood shoulder to shoulder like a band of soldiers. This was pretty much my favorite place in the world. 
Not that I'd ever been outside New Mexico, but I read a lot. Mom always told me the volcano was unsafe without ever really saying why. But to me, it had always felt quiet and calm. It also happened to be where I trained. After the docs had said there was no way to fix my bum leg, I spent hours hiking the beast, thinking if I could just make my shorter leg stronger, then my limp would be less noticeable. No such luck. But by walking the rim's edge, I learned how to be a boss at balancing, and that's a handy skill when you get shoved around by kids at school. I sat down my cane and began teetering along the rim of the crater while holding my arms out to my sides. Mom would kill me if she knew I did this. One slip and I'd tumble 50 feet down the rocky hill. Rosie cruised behind me, sniffing the ground. How about I pretend to be sick, I said, still stuck on how to get out of Holy Ghost School. Or I could release rats into the cafeteria. There can't be school if there's no food, right? Do Catholic schools even have a cafeteria? The only problem was my idea would only buy me a day or two. A low rumble rolled across the sky. Rosie and I both stopped in our tracks and looked up. A small aircraft zoomed over the beast, turned, and came back. I stepped away from the crater's edge, craning my neck to get a better look. I waved, hoping the pilot would see me, but he didn't come near enough. Instead, he started zigzagging like a crazy person. I thought maybe he was a burrato until he circled back perfectly for another run. This time he came in tighter, just when I thought the pilot was going to pull up, he pointed the plane's nose toward the center of the crater. The wings were so close to me I could practically see the screws holding them together. The plane's thrust shook the ground, sending me stumbling, but I caught myself. Then something started glowing inside the cockpit, an eerie yellowish-blue light except what I saw had to have been some kind of hallucination or optical illusion, because there was no pilot. There was a thing, an alien head thing with red bulging eyes, no nose, and a mouth filled with long, sharp fangs. Yeah, that's right. An alien demon dude was flying the plane right into the beast's mouth. Everything happened in sickeningly slow motion. I heard a crash and a fiery explosion rocked the world big enough to make even the planets shake. I did a drop roll as flames burst from the top of the volcano. Rosie yelped, Rosie! And before I knew it, I was tumbling down, 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 away from the beast, away from my dog, and away from life as I knew it. And that is the end of chapter one. Um, So if you want to find more about Zane and what happens with the plane that crashes into the volcano, um, this is called Storm Runner. uh, And you can check it out from Book Dash. And you can take any library book out from Book Dash and I'll deliver it to your A1 class.